all currents of humanitarianism blame all problems, social problems, political problems, conflict, evil, on unjust social structures. So there is, as Rousseau famously said in 1749, man is naturally good. And that affirmation of natural human goodness means that if only we change the character of society, if we change social structures, then what we've hitherto called evil will disappear. And I think that's the nub of the matter, this, yeah. uh, this confidence that uh, human beings are free to order the nature of reality at will, a kind of emancipation of the human will, as you very nicely put it, not only from God's sovereignty, but from any sense of limits. And, and humanizing limits. We have to understand limits are not some uh, restraint on us being ourselves. Limits are the precondition of being fully uh, human. Well, good day, folks, and thank you for joining us on The Public Square and Everything in It. I like to think of this video cast as the thinking person's alternative to The Price is Right. Uh, today, it's our pleasure to welcome Daniel Mahoney to the show. Uh, Dr. Mahoney is a professor of uh, political philosophy or po political science uh, at Assumption College. He is the author of uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, The Ascent from Ideology. I started reading uh, this uh, Soviet dissident when I lived in Russia in the late, uh, late 90s and then later found Dr. Mahoney's book that helped me to interpret his uh, broader writings. He's also he's author of a number of other things, but today we're going to fo focus the discussion on this book, The Idol of Our Age. Now, I've got the hardback edition, and the paperback edition, uh, I think, is releasing now or soon. And so it came out on April 14th. April the 14th. So um, It's available at Amazon and also through Encounter Books in New York. And through Encounter. Uh, so those of you out there watching, this is a small book. It's manageable. And I highly recommend that you buy it. It has quickly become a kind of a component part of my way of thinking, the themes and the ideas in the book. And so um, he's uh, one of the finest political theorists in the world and a prolific writer and very grateful. Uh, Dr. Honey, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. And uh, this is a great pleasure to do, to do and a great pleasure to do, particularly in this time when we... Uh, we, we uh, are all a little bit isolated, so it's good to connect to a larger audience and talk about important things. It is. We've got a, we've got a great audience here, and one of the things that they like, and uh, my first question in every interview is just to ask the person I'm talking with to tell us a little bit about their life story. How did you end up being a political theorist, and how did you get to where you are today? All right, I'll try to give you a brief answer to that open-ended question. No, it's always an uh, an intellectually minded kid, you know, in this, I was born in 1960, in the 60s, I, you know, I love to read, I would go to the library, my sister and I would bicycle, we lived all over the place, and that's another story, born in New York City, but lived in the Midwest, eventually ended up in Massachusetts when I was 12, but we would, my sister and I would drive to the public library once a week and take out books, and I particularly enjoyed reading nonfiction, history, geography, as well as literature, I also, early on, loved to read about religion. And, uh, and so I think in about eighth grade, I won, I was graduating from my Catholic school in eighth grade, and I won some kind of award for academic achievement. And they asked me what I wanted to do, and I said I wanted to be a college professor. And at that time, I think I said history, because I didn't know of these other possibilities, like philosophy, theology, political philosophy. But... Um, I was always very driven that way, always, even in college, you know, I was the kind who, I did all my reading for uh, my classes, but I also liked to go to the library and read the periodicals and take out books on various subjects that were sometimes much more interesting than the ones being taught in school. And um, I, uh, you know, it's funny, I've written a lot, you, you pointed out my work on Alexander Solzhenitsyn, I, uh, I did my report in eighth grade, we had to pick a mm. world writer of interest to us. And I did a presentation on Solzhenitsyn. That was 1973, 1974, around the time the Gulag Archipelago came out. But I remember reading the Gulag Archipelago, the first volume at least, when it came out. And Solzhenitsyn had a very major influence on me from, uh, from uh, you know, right, right from the beginning. And I, I made, and uh, one of the reasons I turned to uh, writing uh, a great deal about Solzhenitsyn was a kind of dissatisfaction I had that um, the 
experts, you know, the Russianists in particular, who wrote on Solzhenitsyn, did so in an ideologically charged way, mm -hmm. uh, calling him names like Slavophile, not that it's terrible to be a Slavophile, but, uh, you know, essentially reducing him to a reactionary Russian thinker of no interest or import to the contemporary and modern and Western world. And all of that was nonsense. And it's very, very nice when the Center for Mediology came out in 2001, I had sent a copy to the Solzhenitsyns in Moscow, but also, no, I think to the son Ignat, and who was living in Philadelphia. And uh, he then shared a copy with his parents. And the response from the Solzhenitsyns was extremely enthusiastic. You know, the sense that here was somebody taking Solzhenitsyn on his own terms, uh, open to the sort of inner meaning of his work, et cetera, et cetera. And I've had a very, very, I worked on the Solzhenitsyn Reader, New and Essential Writings, 1947 and 2005, with the full cooperation of the Solzhenitsyn family. That was with my old friend, mm -hmm. the late departed Ed Erickson, who was uh, taught at Calvin College, another Solzhenitsyn, amateur Solzhenitsyn scholar, who I think delves deeply into the truths of the heart of Solzhenitsyn's writing and thinking. I've written a lot on good, good currents of continental, especially French thought. Um, uh, you know, everyone knows the Pomos and the various nihilists who have dominated French thought from the 60s on, but the fact that there's vibrant and first-rate work by French philosophers, theologians, political theorists that point in a very different, more humane, anti-nihilistic, anti-totalitarian, often Christian direction is not sufficiently known in the ang ang Anglo-American world. And I played a major role, I think, in correcting that misimpression. And I write a lot on statesmanship, De Gaulle, Churchill, and others trying to recover the idea of noble statecraft, and an awful lot on the intersection of religion and politics. Mm -hmm. um, I've noticed this drift toward a kind of loose humanitarian thinking as a kind of substitute for authentic Christian moral and political reflection, and that's the responding to that has become a major theme of my work. I have taught at Assumption College, a small Catholic college in Massachusetts since uh, Labor Day 1986. I'm mm -hmm. 60, but I'm an old timer here because I'm just, just finishing my 35th year of teaching. So I started young and uh, most of my family is in Massachusetts. I love this part of the country, even though um, they vote the wrong way. They consistently <laughs> And I use that as a metaphor more than a comment on partisan politics, but uh, this part of the country has become exceedingly progressivist. For example, there used to be a lot of pro-life Democrats when I first came here in the 70s, and the Democratic Party here, for, for that matter, the Republican Party, as my friend Mary Ann Glendon likes to say, they support abortion on demand through the 19th month. You know? Wow, yeah. Well, you know, this brings us actually to, uh, we're gonna dive right in. Uh, fo folks, if you're looking, we're going to talk about this book, some of the ideas in this book, The Idol of Our Age. And uh, it's become one of my favorite pieces of cultural criticism. And in it, uh, you talk about an ideology, false religion, if you will, that can be called humanitarianism or uh, the religion of humanity. And this is an iteration and a fascinating one, uh, for those of you who are watching, uh, of the pro pro project by a number of Western cultural elites to sever sacred order from social order to kind of fire God from his post and live without limits. And um, so Dr. Mahoney, will you take a moment and describe what this ideology is? We've got our audience is, is very broad. We've got professors listening, but we also have undergrad students, uh, seminary students. So just in a, a two or three minute nutshell, what is this, this thing that we're talking about religion of humanity? Yeah, by the way, the phrase was first used uh, positively and self-consciously by August Comte, the founder, the high priest of the religion of humanity, who was a French sociologist and philosopher, who basically said uh, the political, the theological, the metaphysical ages were over. We had now entered a pos the age of positive science. The old why questions were meaningless and to be rejected, and the only questions that mattered were the how questions. What was interesting about Comte, who was rather a bizarre theorist, but quite brilliant, was he tied that positivism, that anti-metaphysical ire, that hatred of questions about ultimate things, to uh, a religion of humanity where 
l'humanité, humanity, mankind, became le grand être, the great being, the highest thing in the universe. So what Comte did, and this is why I think he's terribly important, he made, he said quite openly was that what was implicit in so many modern currents of thought, namely the affirmation of radical human autonomy, even, and this is where Comte goes, the self-deification of man. Uh, and, and that's really quite a remarkable thing to say human self-sovereignty, or what Solzhenitsyn called anthropocentricity, anthropocentric humanism, a humanism where man is shorn of God, uh, that that is, in effect, the religion that ought to undergird modernity, modern democracy, the modern project. So I spent a lot of time, a little time at least, on Comte because Comte said sort of explicitly, emphatically, what a lot of people presuppose today without thinking it through in an intellectually serious way. Uh, and then, and humanitarianism more broadly, I say, is marked by a deep commitment to this worldly amelioration. By the way, we're all interested in improving common life. But this idea that human nature and society can be fundamentally uh, uh, transformed, and even in a stroke, that there's no enduring human nature, that there's no enduring drama of good and evil in the human soul, that the kingdom of God can be actualized permanently and in this world, not just the mustard seeds of the kingdom, but you know this full actualization of a, a kind of secular religious utopia. And then I would think all currents of humanitarianism blame all problems, social problems, political problems, conflict, evil on unjust social structures. So there is, as Rousseau famously said in 1749, man is naturally good. Yeah. And that affirmation of natural human goodness means that if only we change the character of society, if we change social structures, then what we've hitherto called evil will disappear. And I think that's the nub of the matter, this, yeah. uh, this confidence that uh, human beings are free to order the nature of reality at will, a kind of emancipation of the human will, as you very nicely put it, not only from God's sovereignty, but from any sense of limits and, and humanizing limits. We have to understand limits are not some uh, restraint on us being ourselves. Right. Limits are the precondition of being fully uh, human. So we're going to go to break in a minute, but for those of you watching, I do want to underscore, uh, if we had time, I'd underscore everything that Dr. Mahoney just said, but one of them in particular is that there's a move afoot to sort of blame all of the evils and injustices in this world on unjust social structures. And so on the one hand, the Bible does teach that individual, the sins of individuals coalesce at the social level to warp institutions. That's always been true, always will be. But on the other hand, the, the move that's afoot is to s sort of uh, place all, all of the weight of anything that goes bad on unjust social structures. And then there's also a move to, uh, on behalf of progressives, to overthrow those social structures, not to reform them, but to sort of burn them to the ground and, and rebuild them. Uh, we're going to take a break uh, in, for a moment, but don't leave us. We've been talking with uh, Dr. Daniel Mahoney who is, has taught me a lot about this uh, progressive move, this to promote a religion of humanity. Right after the break, we are going to delve a little deeper and show how this false ideology pervades progressive politics. Hi there, friends. Thank you for joining me on The Public Square and Everything in It. Now, in case you're a person interested in further studies, I want to take a moment to talk with you about our Master of Divinity and Master of Arts degrees. If you enter the Master of Divinity program here at Southeastern, your studies will be facilitated by a world-class faculty, and you will find yourself connected to a community of very sharp MDiv students who are studying to serve as pastors, missionaries, counselors, teachers, and other ministry positions. We combine a strong biblical and theological core with an equally strong emphasis on practical applications such as preaching, pastoral ministry, ethics, counseling, and missions. On the other hand, if you're interested in the Master of Arts, you might want to take a look at our research MA in Apologetics, MA in Christian Philosophy, or MA in Ethics, Theology, and Culture. If you're interested in applying for the MDiv or MA, 
or take a look at our academic catalog, you can visit apply.sebts.edu or you can email us at admissions at sebts.edu. And we're back. We've been talking about a trend in Western culture with uh, Dr. Daniel Mahoney. Uh, a trend, especially among the progressive elite, in which people think that humanity can take a great leap forward, uh, that we can evolve, and um, uh, just get rid of the things that cause evil, which primarily are strong forms of religion and strong forms of the nation state. So if we can live uh, in a world that is uh, borderless and in which strong forms of religion don't hold sway, the world will be a much better place. So. Let's talk about the anthropology that is operative in the religion of humanity. Uh, those of you watching the show know that we have pointed out that ideologies tend to have idols uh, beneath them. Uh, uh, thinkers tend to absolutize something uh, other than God and put something other than God on the throne. And once that's happened, you've got an idolatrous ideology. And the other thing you always want to look for in an ideology is the anthropology. And if the anthropology has gone wrong, you know you've got a bad system. We talked about that with uh, Dr. Uh, David Coises uh, about the uh, false anthropology and Marxism a few weeks ago. And now we want to ask Dr. Mahoney if he can sort of walk us through Comte's anthropology. What was his view of the human being? Yeah, and let me begin just very briefly by mentioning that when uh, Professor Ashford and I use the words, uh, word ideology, we're not using it as a synonym for a worldview or perspective. My students often say, oh, conservatism is an ideology, liberalism is an ideology, Christianity is, is an ideology. Ideology in the specific sense is a deformation of reality. It's a kind of, as Eric Vogelin, the political theorist put it, an imposition of a second reality on the created natural order. And that means an ignoring of fundamental truths about the structure of reality and the nature of the human person. And I think you're quite right, and that means there's always uh, terrible anthropological errors at the heart of these deforming ideologies. In Combe's case, uh, there was something extremely brutal and cruel and wrong-headed and unphilosophical, and I could go on, about his uh, 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 extremely doctrinaire and dogmatic claim that we are not allowed to ask the fundamental questions that give, the philosophical and theological questions that give meaning to our humanity. We can't ask about God. We can't ask about the purpose of things. We can't ask about the ends of human freedom. These are the notorious why questions. Uh, perhaps, you know, they played a role in some pre-scientific metaphysical age, but they have no role to play in the age of positive science. So. That's scientism, and usually lurking behind Marxism and, Kant, uh, and, and other ideologies like the religion of humanity is a kind of scientism, a reduction of the tests of reason, a reduction of our understanding of what reality is, and frankly, an account of the human being that has no place for the embodied soul. So uh, that's part of the problem. I think, though, uh, we have to come back to the point we made before the break about the denial of intrinsic evil. And by the way, I do not think it's correct to say authentic Christianity teaches us that human beings are just incorrigibly evil. It's not coextensive with dark pessimism, but it is a realism, and it's a realism that affirms the necessity of God's grace to redeem fallen human nature but also um, the, um, the, the, the fact that um, uh, evil is not simply um, other people's fault. You know, I think what separates Christ from a Muhammad and so many spurious uh, 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 figures in the history of religion is uh, our Lord told us to point the sword inward, right? Not to blame, not to scapegoat others but to see the evil within our own hearts. And uh, I would say in religious forms of progressivism, and this is tied to an anthropological mistake, there is a constant emphasis, and it's tied to blaming everything on social structures. You know, people who do evil things are uh, wrong-headed, they're wrong-headed, their consciousness is misformed, they're, they're anything but 
evildoers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that's a terrible problem because while the God of the Bible is a merciful God, uh, I mean, and his, his mercy surpasseth all understanding. Uh, uh, on the other hand, um, look, you just have to open scriptures. Start with the Gospel of Mark. From chapter one on, you hear a constant evocation to repentance, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think when progressivism takes a Christian or pseudo-Christian form, you end up with an affirmation of mercy severed from justice and repentance. Mm. And I see that all over the place. You know, the idea that if people are in prison, it's one thing, you know, to carry out the corporal works of mercy and to visit those who are in prison. It's another thing to let them out out of a misplaced sense of a mercy. I sometimes compare myself to that Sister Prejean, they made the movie about in uh, Louisiana, the woman who was you know, rallying yeah. against capital punishment. There was a French Catholic saint at the beginning of the 20th century, Teresa of the Little Flower, Teresa of Leisure. She had a special ministry for those who were to be executed. She didn't rally for them to be non not executed. She didn't declare capital punishment to be intrinsical evil, evil, which is hard to do, I think, on authentic biblical and philosophical grounds. She prayed that these terrible criminals, mainly murderers, would repent before they died. Mm. And I think if you compare the social justice warrior with a, uh, Teresa Blasier, you see a very different attitude. One that... That's a beautiful illustration, I think, actually, that you just, uh, that you gave us. And one of the points you made in your book that stuck out to me is the deep irony that this ethos, this humanitarian ethos is deeply moralistic, but also relativist. And you would think that if a person were a relativist, they wouldn't be uh, puritanical, that they wouldn't be uh, moralist. Um, why this ironic combination? Yeah, I would say... That is a phenomenological observation I made. When I try to, when I, I think about the fanatics on the campuses or the whole woke culture, and a lot of this is just an amplification and radicalization of stuff that's been around since the 60s and before, um, I've always been struck by that mixture of toxic moralism and toxic relativism. Years ago, I read a book by the great, um, well, a British, a Hungarian British scientist and philosopher, Michael Polyani. And he spoke about something called moral inversion. He said, look, the official currents in philosophy and the social sciences talk about a fact value distinction. Reason could tell us nothing about the good, that our moral judgments are arbitrary, relative, etc. cetera. But uh, Polanyi pointed out human beings by nature were constituted to make judgments because those moral judgments are intrinsic to reality. So he says, when people don't make them out of the open using their reason, they go underground and they come back out as moral fanaticism. Yep. Commitments, you know, as the French say, engagé, you know, you're committed and there's no reason that can get in the way. So I think Polanyi got it just right, that this moral inversion leads people on the one hand to say, who's to say what's right and wrong? On the other hand, their particular commitments are never limited by introspection, by, uh, uh, by the requirements of common life, by uh, right reason, as Cicero called it. And so you end up with, and anyway, anyone, since these guys are antinomian, since they fundamentally believe that liberty under law is tyranny, that it's a restriction on absolute human freedom, those of us who believe that liberty under law, and I mean not just simply secular or civic law, but the moral law, God's law, both, the natural law. Uh, those of us who appeal to liberty under law, we're not only misguided, we are enemies of the emancipation or liberation of the human race. So it all makes sense. But I recently read an article where somebody says, oh, conservatives are always talking about moral relativism, but there's no moral relativism out there. People are very passionate. And that's a silly response because what they, uh, the, the combination, the, uh, the, this, uh, this really horrific combination of toxic moralism and toxic relativism is the sort of default stance of late modern human beings. Yeah, you know, uh, those of you watching the show, 
I've mentioned Charles Taylor's name a few times. I want to mention him again here to back up Dr. Mahoney's point. He, Taylor talked about what he called the extraordinary moral inarticulacy of our, our modern age. And by that, he meant that uh, we're living beyond our means. We have nothing to undergird our, our moral principles. And, and so on the one hand, we have the highest aspirations and ideals ever in human history. Eradicate poverty, justice and equality for all. I mean, really big stuff. Get rid of war forever. Uh, but on the other hand, we can't fund it because in, in the past, uh, and especially if you're young, you, you won't have any memory of this, but in, in past uh, decades and centuries, people believed in a transcendent and objective moral law that was outside of us. And so when we argued with each other, we argued toward truth. And we could go away from the argument not hating each other. But now that there is uh, not very often a belief in a transcendent and objective moral law, uh, truth is located within, subjectively. And so then when somebody disagrees with your truth, especially maybe your sexuality or, or, or whatever, it feels like hatred or bigotry. And in that sort of sense, the only thing that's left is for us to shout each other down. And I, Dr. Mahoney's project, my project, I think the project of historic Christian orthodoxy is to somehow recover the frightening beauty of the moral law to help our, our nation to recognize that, yes, it's frightening, to be under the reign of a, a cosmic king who gives a moral law, but it's also beautiful and it's free. And so now that my last glorious question, liberty of the children of God, as somebody said, that's right. <laughs> now, now my, my last question, I'm going to combine a couple by of the way. Let me tell you all your readers, read an <laughs> essay by CS Lewis. I think he wrote it right after the abolition of man. It's called the poison of subjectivism. Hmm. And every word of it is descriptive of our situation today. Because when we reduce religion and the moral law to pure interiority and not to something objective and real, we've in, a, in effect given up the ghost. We think mm -hmm. we're defending values, but we're, feel, we're defending something empty. We're defending, you know, uh, um, we're defending some arbitrary understanding that has nothing to do with the moral law. That's, that's great, and I want to second that. Um, we, we're running out of time, so that's our last question. I'm going to combine a couple questions I had in mind. In Chapter 6, uh, and I hope I'm describing uh, what you said correctly fr from my memory. But you can correct me if I'm not, but it seems like you're saying that, that Pope Francis is a sometime accomplice of the religion of humanity. Not, not completely in that camp, but sort of unwittingly, uh, his thinking has been affected by um, this religion of humanity. So could you describe that a little bit and then pivot to just give a couple of minutes of advice to those of us who are listening to you? How, how should Christians respond? Well, I do think Pope Francis is uh, what I call a half humanitarian in chapter six of the book. Um, I think some of his views are very troubling. I think some of them are not in accord uh, with um, historic orthodoxy. Um, I am, I'm not a pet politrist. I'm a Roman Catholic, but I don't believe uh, that uh, what a pope says defines what historic orthodoxy is. If that were right, then uh, there would be no, I think, no legitimate argument for papal authority. It would be a form of willfulness. Um, and that, that can't be right. The, the natural moral law and God's sovereignty informs the self-understanding of the church. No, I think Pope, uh, Pope uh, Francis, in many ways, a good man, uh, deeply marked by his Argentinian experience. But um, he is somebody, I think, who has a hard time acknowledging the legitimacy of punishment in the civic realm. I think there's no, uh, I think there's absolutely no biblical or, or philosophical, theological support for that. Um, I think, you know, what he's taught about the death penalty somehow being evil is not in accord with historic orthodoxy. I think he is, um, he said in an interview with a French uh, sociologist, Dominique Fulton, a book that was published a year or two ago, that war is always wrong. Well, war can't always be wrong. I think there's no scriptural support for that. It violates common sense. And look, if you, if you think war is always wrong, then you have to believe the police defending innocent people against thugs and rapists and murderers are always wrong. If, uh, I do not believe this. I'm with St. Augustine in his great commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. I do not believe that the 
Sermon on the Mount is a literal call to non-resistance. It's about the inner disposition of the disciple of Christ. Uh, and uh, the, uh, so we, um, I am mean, disturbed by the kind of indulgence, uh, which is not in accord with the Catholic tradition. The Catholic tradition, the Catholics did very well in the 20th century, standing up to the evil of communism and totalitarianism in both its Nazi and communist forms. But you know, this Pope, uh, he went to Cuba in 2015 and said Fidel Castro was uh, uh, my friend. Well, this is a man who had outlawed Christmas for 50 years, persecuted the church. The church is still under the the foot, the ju uh, uh, the juggernaut of the of the, of the totalitarian state. I think the policy a policy of abandoning the underground church in China. All Christians are imperiled in China, Protestant and Catholic, but the Catholic Church has suffered terribly since 1949. And for their loyalty, they've gotten a Vatican, which is, uh, as they uh, we say in the colloquial, playing footsie with the Politburo in Beijing. So it's all very disturbing. And uh, the Vatican is having something called the Global Humanitarian Alliance in October of next year. It was supposed to be on May 14th. And again, there's nothing specifically Christian about this. It's just sort of standard left-wing themes that, you know, if we really believe in right reason, things like climate change have to be the discussion, uh, have to be the subject of, of, of reasoned disputation and investigation and not of, you know, some kind of eschatological sentiment, you know? And uh, so I think these are disturbing. On the other hand, uh, uh, um, Pope Francis's immediate predecessor, Pope Benedict, said in his Regensburg address, a wonderful address in 2006, Christianity is not, is not, and is never reducible to a humanitarian moral message. Benedict was extremely clear about that. John Paul II was extremely clear about that. We have a Pope who's not extremely clear about that. I find that disturbing, but since I'm not a papalatrist, I feel totally obliged as a Catholic Christian to speak up uh, in defense of the natural law, in defense of uh, political reason, in defense of historic orthodoxy. There are many of us, including some prominent people in the hierarchy of the church who feel the same way. But um, I do think this is a failed opportunity for the church because I think the church had won a lot of respect in some evangelical and Protestant circles because of its commitment to the defense of life this forthright opposition to abortion and euthanasia, for example, that marked the pontificate of John Paul II. And when the, when the church risked becoming the left-wing party at prayer, and by the way, you know there's an evangelical version of this. Yep. I could name names. There's a liberal Protestant version of this. It's a disease that is universal. But it's, it's bad for, it's bad for uh, historic orthodoxy when these currents infect uh, the Church of Rome and its very highest. So I say I say all these things respectfully, but truthfully. I think they have to be said, and um, um, because our loyalty always, whatever denomination we're in, has to be to the weight of Christian wisdom and to right reason, as it manifests itself in our moral and philosophical traditions and historic orthodoxy. It can't simply be to the zeitgeist as expressed by progressivist clergy. Yeah, and I'll, I want to jump in here as a, a committed uh, evangelical Baptist and just say to those of you who are watching that uh, we have to be vigilant um, in all of our, our churches and our denominations uh, that our students are being trained at public universities and even private universities and trained in ways that are uh, very unhelpful, that are uh, the ways of thinking that are sort of instilled in them by their professors, even at some of our Baptist colleges, uh, sort of infect their thinking. And uh, unwittingly, these students allow false ideologies to uh, warp and shape their Christianity even. So uh, we've come to the end of our show today, but we're so grateful for Dr. Uh, Mahoney. Uh, thank you for coming on the show today. Oh, great fun. I really enjoyed it. And I'm going to say to those of you out there, this won't be the last time we have him on the show. We're going to arrange to do an interview about Alexander Solzhenitsyn and his uh, in his courageous stand uh, against the Soviet Union. I think they're one of the great one of the great men and great Christians of the 20th century. And I think he's got lessons he can teach us for how we can uh, uh, stand strong in, in our own uh, historical moment. For those, not my lies. <laughs> that's right. um, for those of you who are watching, thank you for joining us, and we hope that you will join us again soon on the Public Square and everything in it. Take care. 
and have a great day.